Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to our panelists, and thanks especially to Elad Uzan, who is the primary organizer of this event today. I will uh, speak first. I'm Jeff McMahon. I'm going to introduce the other five speakers, and we're going to speak in, in this order from whatever it is from, from Helen on down. Um, Helen Fro from the University of Stockholm, Janina Dill uh, from Oxford, Zosha Stimplaska from Oxford, Massimo Rinzo from Philosophy and the Law School at King's College London, and uh, Elad Uzan, who is here as a postdoc visiting from Israel, working here uh, with me. And so we will speak in that order after we've uh, each given a short presentation. Um, each we will open up the uh, discussion for questions, comments from the audience, including people who are um, joining us via Zoom. So I'm going to start. I'll speak for about um, this. Make sure I don't overrun my time. I will speak for about 10 or 12 minutes. I think that's the limit for each of us. So let me begin by saying that I'm going to take it for granted that there's not the slightest shred of justification for the current Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is not a humanitarian intervention. It is not a war of defense by Russia against Ukraine. It's not even a war of preventive defense by Russia against Ukraine. There is no just cause for this war. And because of that, I think this war is in a way a refutation of the traditional theory of the just war, and in some ways a, an advertisement for the alternative revisionist perspective on the ethics of war. And that's because, according to the traditional theory of the just war, Russian soldiers in Ukraine now, or at least those Russian soldiers who are not committing war crimes, which many of them are, at least those who are not doing that are acting wholly morally permissibly. As they're not doing anything wrong as long as they're not killing civilians or destroying civilian infrastructure, as long as they're confining their targets to uh, Ukrainian military. And I think this war shows that that is just obviously false. Russian soldiers who are killing Ukrainian soldiers who are trying to defend their homeland against this invasion and occupation are committing murder. They are killing wholly innocent people without the slightest bit of justification for it. And according to revisionist just war theory, which says that war has to be evaluated in accordance with the principles that govern harming and killing of people in all contexts, it is clear that all the instances of the use of force and violence by Russian troops in Ukraine are wrong, immoral, and impermissible. And I think what this shows is that the traditional theory of the just war, which says that what Russian soldiers are doing as long as they're not violating the rules of war is permissible, what it shows is that that theory is pernicious. It's what enables Russian soldiers to do what they are doing in good conscience, or what they think is good conscience. Now we might ask, are these Russian soldiers excused for what they're doing because of ignorance? It's certainly true that they are being systematically lied to, and that the people in Russia are being systematically lied to by their government. But I think it's easier for these people to know that they are being lied to than it is for people in, for example, the United States who were systematically lied to day after day by Donald Trump to know that they were being lied to. And that's because in Russia, the major media are controlled by the state. And those that had some independence of state control have been shut down and social media are being blocked. People who speak out against the war 
or who make claims that contradict the lies that the people are being told there are jailed for this. In those conditions, surely people must know we're not being told all the truth. And surely Russian soldiers must know this when they go into the Ukraine and what they find <coughs> is not people welcoming them as liberators. What they find is not offensive military uh, uh, preparations, but what they find is people trying desperately to defend themselves against the tanks that are coming into the country and the planes and so on that are bombing the place to bits. So I think what we can conclude is that Russian soldiers are allowing themselves to be used as tools in the hands of one of the great villains of human history. Uh, they have converted themselves into what Kant would call mere means. They are just means for the uh, 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 doing of great evil by the, man, uh, by the elites in, in Russia. One of the things that surprises me about this, too, is that surely Putin must know that Hitler is going, sorry, that history is going to treat him the way it treats Hitler and Stalin and Mao. He will be forever regarded as the man who is guilty of the atrocities we are seeing committed in Ukraine today. And he's a man governed entirely by self-interest, and yet he's willing to go down in history in this way. That puzzles me a lot. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about Russian soldiers. It seems to me that they are morally liable to any use of force and violence by uh, defenders of the Ukraine that can be brought to bear against them. But in fact, direct military intervention by states outside uh, 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 other than the Ukraine seems to me uh, to be immoral or wrong. And that's because it would be disproportionate and that's because of the threat of escalation to nuclear war, a threat that Putin has made very explicit. That's the lengths to which this man is willing to go to threaten nuclear <laughs> annihilation to anyone who resists his ambitions. This illustrates the way in which villains can manipulate morality to their own advantage, because if it weren't for this threat of escalation to nuclear war, I think direct military intervention by other countries would not only be permissible, but arguably morally required to defend innocent people in Ukraine from what's being done to them. But we can still do other things. We're reduced to means of trying to stop what's going on there that stop short of, of war. One of the main means is economic sanctions. But economic sanctions always raise questions because they harm people who are arguably innocent. They harm innocent civilians in Russia. Now, I want to say a little something about this because I think economic sanctions, uh, as severe as we can possibly manage, are morally imperative. They are required. Now, the two ways in which economic sanctions might be intended to function. The main way, of course, is to try to reduce the economic power and therefore the overall power of the Russian government and uh, to, in a way, harm the wealthy elites whose support has made this possible for Putin and has enabled Putin to, to, to remain in power. These people are morally liable to harms inflicted upon them in defense of the people of Ukraine. And we can think economic sanctions, of course, do harm innocent civilians in Russia, but we can see that as a side effect of action intended to harm the elites. And it can be justified, presumably, as uh, on grounds of lesser evil. The harms to the civilians are a lesser evil than the evils that are being perpetrated against the, the people in Ukraine. But what about sanctions that might actually be intended to harm civilians in Russia? Is the only justification for those 
intended sanctions, assuming this is part of the intention of the economic sanctions, that it's the lesser evil. And I think not. Uh, my view is that there can be a liability justification for inflicting these harms on Russian civilians. And that's because in the circumstances, it seems to me that civilians in Russia have a duty to protest against what their government is doing. They have a duty to bring pressure to bear on their government to stop doing what the government is doing to people in Ukraine. Of course, people in Russia, if they protest, they risk imprisonment. So, and we can't demand too much of particular individuals. But it seems to me that if enough Russians were to coordinate their, coordinate their action and act together, it would be much safer for them. So we saw early in the war 100,000 civilians in the streets of Berlin protesting against what Russia was doing in the Ukraine. If we had 100,000 civilians in the streets of Moscow, that might cause the government and the elites to reconsider what they are doing. Um, but it seems to me, given that I believe Russian civilians have a duty to protest, to bring pressure to bear on their government, it's a duty that most of them are not fulfilling. They are therefore liable to be harmed by economic sanctions in relatively minor ways in an effort to bring pressure to bear on them, to force them to bring pressure to bear on their government. As if insofar as they're not fulfilling their duty to protest, they are making themselves morally liable to pressures from us and others elsewhere in the world to get them to try to stop what their government is doing. And that's because harm now is unavoidable. Either they're going to be more and more and greater harms inflicted on innocent Ukrainian civilians, or Russian civilians might have to make some sacrifices, undergo some minor suffering uh, in order to try to minimize, mitigate, alleviate, prevent further harm to civilians in Ukraine. So I think that's the argument in favor of economic sanctions. The economic sanctions seem to me to be entirely morally justifiable, even if they do uh, uh, inflict widespread, though minor, harms on civilians in Russia. Um, this was on the cover of today's Guardian. You may, other people have seen it in the news. It's a, it's a woman in Russia who works for one of the uh, television stations there bringing a poster saying, you're being lied to, we, we should oppose this war. This woman is doing what, I mean, she's in jail now, I think, I'm sure, and I, God knows what's going to happen to her. Um, this is incredibly admirable. This woman has far more courage than Russian soldiers who are in Ukraine do. That's because she has not only physical courage, but moral courage. And that's what the soldiers in, the Russian soldiers in Ukraine lack. Thank you. Helen. So there are two things that I'd like to talk about. Um, the first is something that Jeff has already touched on, which is the moral significance of the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. Now, traditional approaches to the ethics of war place enormous moral weight on this distinction. And the traditional view holds not only that killing civilians is morally worse than killing combatants, but also that, as Jeff said, Russian combatants do nothing wrong when they kill Ukrainian combatants. And this distinction is routinely emphasized in both political discussions and also in reporting on the war, where it's become now routine for news outlets to focus on the killing of civilians in Ukraine, single out these attacks for particular condemnation. Now, I think that we should reject the idea that being a combatant or a civilian is morally significant in the way that these discussions suppose. And this rejection has two dimensions. Um, the first is a rejection of the view that civilians can never be legitimate targets in war. Now, whether a person is wronged by being attacked tracks facts about what she has done or what she will do or fail to do. And both combatants and civilians can do things that cause them to forfeit their rights against intentional harm. 
Now, the second dimension, which I think is perhaps more interesting for our current purposes, is a rejection of the view that combatants are always legitimate targets, even if they're engaged in justified defense. And one of the problems with focusing on the killing of civilians and doing so by emphasizing the fact that they are civilians is that it implies that killing combatants is less bad than killing civilians, or perhaps not even wrong at all. And I think the war in Ukraine shows us very starkly just how implausible that view is. Now, this is in part because it's just, as Jeff said, it's so transparent that everything that the Russian combatants do is impermissible, that they have no legitimate targets at all because theirs is an unjustified war. And so the traditional view that we can somehow sort of carve off the morality of how a war is fought from the reasons why it is being fought is clearly false. And it's also in part because we've watched as Ukrainian civilians have either volunteered or been conscripted into the Ukrainian army. It's very hard to believe that killing these people is somehow morally better than killing someone who has not enlisted. And to be clear, this isn't a claim that Ukraine is some kind of special case where the usual significance of the combatant and non-combatant distinction doesn't apply. All armed forces are made up of people who have rights against harm. And they don't lose those rights by engaging in justified defensive actions. And that's as true for members of standing armies as it is for conscripts. Now, people often point to the defenseless, defenselessness or the vulnerability of civilians to try to motivate the thought that killing civilians is morally worse than killing combatants. But this argument just doesn't seem very persuasive. So anybody who has been killed by the Russians was, by definition, def defenseless against being killed by the Russians. And likewise, anyone who has been killed was clearly vulnerable to being killed. So the putative difference between combatants and non-combatants can't be a difference between who's vulnerable to being killed and who's not, or who's defenseless and who's not. Rather, the argument seems to be pointing to something like a difference in how likely it is that a civilian might be killed by a particular action compared to how likely it is that that action would kill a combatant. But it's hard to see why we should care about this difference if both people are in fact killed. The fact that the, sort of, there's a possible world out there in which the combatant was not killed and that world is closer to the actual world than the possible world in which the civilian was not killed just doesn't seem terribly important when it comes to judging the badness of killings. Now, we might also point to the fact that killing civilians can be a form of terroristic killing, where the civilians are killed as a means of coercing people into surrendering, for example. And combatant killings, in contrast, are kind of eliminative. You're trying to get rid of the threat that they pose. But even though I agree that it can be especially hard to justify harming people as a means, I'm just not sure how much this matters when it comes to unjustified killings. So it seems unlikely, for example, that a person is permitted to use more defensive force against an attacker who will otherwise unjustifiably and usefully kill her and she may use against an attacker who will unjustifiably and eliminatively kill her or unjustifiably kill her as collateral damage. And moreover, even if this difference did matter, it wouldn't pick out a distinction between killing civilians and killing combatants, but rather a distinction between killing some special subset of civilians and killing other people. And yet the popular view just condemns civilian killings in general as worse than combatant killings, whether or not those killings are terroristic. Now, of course, the other reason why people tend to think that it's especially bad to kill civilians, of course, is that civilians are, for the most part, harmless, right? They're not threatening enemy forces. But that's not very compelling as an explanation of an asymmetry between civilian killing and combatant killings if the combatants don't act wrongly by threatening enemy forces, as is the case when Ukrainian combatants threaten Russian forces. Moreover, the fact that Ukrainian combatants are threatening Russian forces is one reason why killing members of the Ukrainian armed forces is morally worse than killing civilians. Killing Ukrainian combatants weakens the Ukrainian army and makes the Russians' unjust war more likely to succeed. This means that killing Ukrainian combatants is not only an injustice in its own right, but also a means to a further grave injustice. So the kind of practical takeaway here, I don't know if you want to call it that, but such a, as it is, is that we really should stop kind of inadvertently giving this veneer of legitimacy to the killing of Ukrainian soldiers by emphasizing the fact that, kill, that civilians are also being killed. 
All of these people are morally innocent in the relevant respect. That is, they've done nothing to forfeit their rights against harm in a way that could make them legitimate or permissible targets of Russian attacks. Now, the second thing I wanted to raise is a, is a pretty nascent thought about the role and permissibility of collective defense pacts, such as that which exists between NATO, um, NATO members. Now, on the one hand, these agreements can afford parties to them extremely stringent protections. Um, so this is certainly true in the case of NATO. So the fact that an attack on a NATO member could trigger a legal obligation on the part of 29 other states to come to their aid is clearly going to be a huge deterrent to anyone who might be thinking of attacking or invading a NATO member. And that seems like a good thing. But on the other hand, we've seen this pact repeatedly invoked as an explanation of why no NATO member can offer Ukraine any direct military assistance and can offer only kind of limited indirect assistance. So supplying some weapons, but not planes, as we saw in the whole kind of Polish plane saga. Now, the argument roughly seems to be that any greater degree of assistance poses a significant risk of triggering an escalation of the conflict to a degree disproportionate to the initial cause. So we keep hearing that any military assistance provided by a NATO member will lead to World War III. So how compelling is this argument? In answering this, I want to probably somewhat oddly, set aside the question of whether NATO members ought to provide greater or direct military assistance to Ukraine and ask instead whether this defense pact is a good or legitimate reason not to do so. So after all, it's not as if an attack on a NATO member automatically triggers a military response from other members or those other members are somehow compelled then to enter the fight. So if this were true, and it would inevitably result in an escalation to disproportionate force, and there'd be good reason to think that forming these kinds of pacts is impermissible, because they would look like pacts either to use disproportionate force, so clearly that would be wrong, or pacts that somehow make it impossible for members to engage in proportionate other defense. And it seems unlikely that our duties to others allow us to bind ourselves in these ways. Now, the reason why these pacts aren't straightforwardly impermissible in these ways is that a member under attack has to invoke Article 5. That is, they have to ask for assistance. And of course, they can just choose not to do so. So it might be simply impermissible to do so, for example, if this would indeed cause disproportionate escalation. So the idea that, say, the UK is somehow morally prevented from providing military assistance because there'd be this inevitable escalation to World War III just looks unpersuasive. So the UK could provide assistance and then simply not trigger Article 5 in the face of a Russian response. So our hands aren't tied in the way that the government implies. And so it seems misleading to frame the debate about direct military intervention around this kind of narrative. So again, this isn't a claim about what the UK should do, so much as a suggestion that we ought to reject what's fast becoming a kind of dogma about Article 5, that it um, renders any further support of Ukraine impermissible. So there might be lots of reasons not to intervene in Ukraine, but I doubt that Article 5 is one of them. Yanina. Uh, Uh, thank you, Jeff and Elad, for inviting me today. Um, I do slightly disagree with Helen on the complete moral meaninglessness of the civilian combatant distinction, and I hope we can come back to this in Q&A. What I would like to focus on in the next 10 minutes is something slightly different. I would like to pick up three arguments that have really preoccupied public discourse, pundits, Twitter, and scholars of international relations and strategy as well. Moral arguments that are framed as um, moral and in some sense unproblematic, but which really need greater unpacking. The first is that NATO is morally responsible, at least partly for the invasion. The second is that this conflict has once and for all shown democracies to be weak, and there's then often the additional implicit notion that it, they might not be worth having in the first place. And the third is the idea that um, our response to Ukrainian refugees, particularly in Europe, has in some sense be a moral failure. And this can be seen in two radically different ways. So let me start with NATO. Let's just say, as a matter of fact, hypothetically, there are things that NATO did that precipitated Putin's invasion, just as a causal link. Let's say taking Ukraine membership 
off the table categorically or more categorically would have made Putin less likely to intervene. I do not actually believe this is factually correct, but let's focus on what it would mean if it were correct, what it would mean morally. I don't think there was a point in time when NATO was morally required to take membership off the table. Western countries cooperating with Ukraine isn't itself morally wrongful or impermissible. One reason for that is because it never objectively threatened Russia. It therefore never made a would-be invasion morally less wrongful, morally more likely. So even if, as a matter of fact, Western actions shifted Putin's reasoning toward invasion, as long as A, Western actions were morally permissible in their own right, and B, they did not give Putin a morally relevant reason for an invasion, it doesn't seem to me that it matters for our moral judgment of responsibility now what the West did or didn't do. Let's push this argument one step further. There is evidence in writing and in recent speeches by Putin that he sees Ukraine as part of Russia and considers Russia entitled to great power status, of which it was robbed after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It is plausible then that bringing NATO, uh, Ukraine sorry, back into the Russian fold, either through the Belarus model or through outright annexation, was Putin's determinate plan. If that is the case, NATO could have, not, could have done things to prevent this war or to make it less likely that would have potentially been themselves morally wrongful or impermissible, such as actively undermining Ukraine, turning towards the West and turning towards democracy. To finish this point, let me use an analogy. Imagine you and your neighbor have a cooperative scheme whereby you shop for each other. There's a third neighbor that always complains about this, and in fact, you know, for not being included in generally. And one time, at one point in time, that neighbor decides to kill your shopping um, companion. The main thing to say about it, surely, is that this doesn't make the initial cooperative scheme morally less permissible than it was before the killing. And neither does it, in fact, mean that you bear moral responsibility for the death, even partially. You may say, well, there are obvious limits to the analogy here. But I think these limits themselves are instructive. Say, if deciding to shop for your neighbor was ultimately completely trivial, you knew it would make your neighbor likely to be killed, and maybe the would-be victim didn't actually know that. If those conditions were fulfilled, we might think, actually, you do bear some responsibility for their death. But obviously, if you go back to NATO and Ukraine, NATO cooperation with Ukraine is not trivial. It has moral value in its own right. It wasn't at all 100% clear that it would lead to the invasion. In fact, there is the causal link is contestable. And finally, Ukraine knew as much about the implications of cooperating with the West. Ukraine is the relevant moral agent making the decision, as did NATO. So the bottom line here is the fact of cooperation between Western countries and Ukraine doesn't affect the moral wrongfulness of the invasion or the distribution of responsibility. And the invasion does not therefore retroactively affect the moral status of that cooperation. A second argument is this idea that the Russian invasion has somehow shown democracies to be weak, weak in protecting themselves, weak in fighting wars. And alternately, this argument, is, which is obviously a math, well, factual argument, is accompanied with the either implicit or explicit notion that we should really devalue democracy, think about whether it's worth having. Let's deal with the factual question first. There's a really extensive debate in international relations scholarship about the question whether democracies have an intrinsic advantage in fighting wars or whether they are perpetually disadvantaged and must always lose to autocracies. We have opposing theories here. On the one hand, there's the idea that autocracies are nimbler. Um, they can make decisions quickly. They don't have to take domestic constituents into account. They can afford to lose large numbers of troops. So in some sense, that simply means they can prioritize military necessity and imperatives and are therefore likely to win. The opposing theory is that wars are won by militaries that want to fight. Attachment to the nation tends to be stronger in democracies, and therefore democratic militaries tend to be more effective and stronger. There are also issues here with the idea that there's a greater link between skill and rank and possibly less corruption. But this is an abbreviated version of this debate. Now, if we turn to the conflict at hand, we're actually seeing evidence of both these theories. It is obviously not just that Ukraine is a democracy and Russia is not. But regime type may play a role in the fact that Ukrainian forces have outperformed expectations. They seem highly motivated, they attract volunteers and support. On the other hand, in Russia, morale is low, trust is low, and we see very poorly combined arms, which is often an issue of um, low trust and low morale. On the other hand, if numbers are to be believed, and this is the score for the other theory, Russia has lost already about twice as many soldiers um, in a couple of days than the United States has lost in the entire war on terror. 
Waging war at such a cost would not be sustainable for a democracy. War support would plummet. We know that leaders get punished at the ballot box for losing compatriot troops. We know that they know that and that they take that into account in decision making. So for a democracy, that level of attrition would create a very strong incentive to negotiate and withdraw, an incentive that it clearly doesn't do for Russia. It doesn't even seem to create an incentive for Russia to change strategy or tactics. The bottom line here is that the fact that Ukraine is a democracy and Russia is not is implicated in how the war is playing out, but in no way near as straightforward a way as to say, look, democracies are inevitably weak, or look, the bad leader is definitely going to punish and be punished and fail. None of this is a moral question, and we want to talk about moral questions now. The moral question that obviously lingers here in the background is this idea that um, is democracy worth it? Is it sustainable if we cannot in the fact in, um, stand up to the bully? And I find that maddeningly cavalier, because democracy actualizes our most important individual rights, rights that are really at stake in this conflict. For instance, our right to determine um, politically what communities we want to form and how we want to be governed. Democracy as a regime type is also associated with the protection of human rights. So the protection of the most fundamental rights to life and physical integrity that we're talking about. Sure, that is worth the cost of having to make decisions by committee. Notice also the different moral status of the respective advantages that each regime type conveys. Motivated effective militaries on the one hand, and the flexibility to make decisions, including the option to use non, largely non-liable individuals as cannon fodder on the autocracy side. This shows to me just how bizarre it is to draw moral conclusions from what is an ambivalent factual picture, picture the moral conclusion that democracy is somehow flawed, when in fact this seems the moral calculus around democracy seems to be really clear. Thirdly, the final argument. Let me briefly address this debate around uh, Ukrainian refugees. And this is not like one argument that has sort of um, surprisingly resonated across the Twitterverse, even though it is morally flawed, but it is really a debate. There's the idea, is it actually great that we're helping Ukrainian refugees so much to an extent, much more than we used to help Syrian and Afghan refugees, for instance? Or is this just the ultimate proof of our racism, our pro-Western bias, um, our lack of humanity. I won't be able to do justice to this question, but I think it needs to be debated in slightly different terms than either self-congratulation for our unencumbered solidarity with Ukrainians or self-flagellation for racism. So I don't, by the way, that racism likely plays a role, as it often does, um, in our different responses. And I also want to caveat that this question is much more urgent to figure out for Europeans, because from a British point of view, the conclusion is inescapable that we are simply failing in our duties of assistance toward all refugees, including Ukrainians. But how should we think about this difference in response that we have observed? I think we should start from the position that we're all human and that we owe each other certain duties, including assistance in virtue of that humanity. There are then some moral reasons for why we want to prioritize helping some people rather than others. We can think of them in terms of either legitimate partiality or special obligations. For instance, legitimate partiality might track the notion that people who are geographically close or crises that are geographically close, our assistance might have a greater reasonable chance of success, a better impact. If we have entered special relationships with people, made promises, relied on reciprocity, or are we just implicated in their suffering, all of this might mean our duties of assistance towards certain people can be more stringent. But that is the rub. Right? It means our normal duties of assistance to white Ukrainians may be more stringent, but it is not an excuse to fall below the level of the duties of assistance we have to anyone else, including Syrian and Afghan refugees. So we may want to do more for Ukrainians um, than we have to do, but that is an excuse to not do what we have to do for everyone else. There's an alternative way of thinking about this, which is to say, what if I have duties of assistance towards both A and B, but I cannot, from a capacity point of view, do both. Then again, it might kick in if you have special responsibilities or there's legitimate partiality. You might want to help A. But if that were a viable argument, then you, if you want to make that argument, you're in a position where you have to show the factual link that it is in fact not possible for us to do our basic duties of assistance towards all refugees because we have special duties towards Ukrainians. And I don't believe that factual link has been shown. This is also an argument for the British right in general that suggests we need to help British people first before we can help anyone else. 
I believe we fail to help British people as well to the extent of our duties of assistance. But this is due to political choices that we make and not because we want to help anyone else. So the bottom line is here, we can have reasons to go above and beyond our basic duties of assistance and for morally legitimate reason. But that doesn't give us an excuse not to meet basic duties towards everybody else. We can even have reasons to meet basic duties just towards some people than others if our capacity to meet our basic duties towards everyone is limited. But for that to be a viable argument, you have to actually establish the facts of the matter that you cannot possibly meet your basic duties of assistance towards everyone. And I submit to you that we do not have established that link and that we could, in fact, meet our basic duties of assistance towards Ukrainians as well as Afghan, Syrian and all other refugees. Thanks. So thank you, Elad and Jeff, for arranging this event. Thank you for being here. You're performing the great service of giving my family a few hours of break from hearing me talk about Ukraine. I will be uh, adding a footnote to Yanina's talk. I'm going to focus on the NATO blame argument and on admitting refugees with a particular focus on Poland's role in this. So on the NATO blame argument, um, Janina put aside the question whether NATO posed an objective threat, saying she didn't believe it did. So I want to highlight some other things. One is, um, I don't think NATO was seen as a serious threat, even in Russia. So there is a moral authority that we can rely on. Dmitry Muratov, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, editor of Novaya Gazeta, who said in an interview with The New Yorker, in the response to Putin's so-called ultimatum about the so-called non-expansion of NATO, most Russian citizens do not understand this threat. NATO has never attacked Russia. So naturally, there was the Cold War, and before that, Napoleon and Hitler tried to conquer Moscow. But we can all understand that countries can change very fundamentally we can understand it because, in fact, one of the best news of the first week of the war was the news about the German rearmament. There is a country, as it happens, and that happens to be the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that did conquer Moscow. So when did it conquer Moscow? In around 1610. Is it reasonable to think that it still poses threat to Russia? No, it isn't. But is the throwing out of Polish troops from Moscow celebrated in Russia? It is on the 4th of November as the Day of Unity. Who introduced that day and that celebration into Russia, even though this event was not commemorated in Russia or in Poland? It was Putin who introduced it. And we can imagine why this sort of build-up of this narrative of threat in order to justify imperial aims and then justify certain actions when Putin is threatened by the growth of democracies at the border. A separate point about the NATO blame argument is that it erodes the agency of the so-called new member states of NATO and the aspiring states. So Ukraine, as has been amply vindicated, has good reasons to fear Russian invasion and of course has the history of policies by the Russian Federation predecessor, the Soviet Union, that has not been disavowed, but have been celebrated, and the Holodomor, the killing of millions of Ukrainians by Soviet uh, policies of starvation. The states that, unlike Ukraine, have been admitted into Russia also have genuine reasons to threaten Russian invasion. So Poland has been occupied or semi-occupied by Russia since 1772 until 1918, and then again from 1939 until 1989, though of course the first five years of that second occupation was preferable alternative to the other occupation that was happening in the region. But in the newspapers, the talk of the we of NATO is the talk of the old member states, how their sovereignty is not threatened by what Russia does. And we have re-emergence again of Eastern Europe as a concept that has, throughout my childhood, acted as a sort of license or permission 
to exclude the region from standard expectations of what type of trauma and invasion is acceptable in that region. And finally, the focus on that argument at the expense of other arguments is somewhat tendentious because there are other things that countries that happen to be NATO states did to encourage this, even though they didn't do it qua NATO states, and that not reacting to a range of Russian actions and invasions in the past and accepting corruption. So I get the desire to criticize NATO, and I get the desire to first morally evaluate and blame our actions, which just cannot be done at the expense of illuminating this complex territory and at the expense of eroding the agency of countries such as Ukraine that have genuine reasons, defensive reasons, to want NATO protection. So let me want to say something about admitting refugees. So Poland has opened its borders, absorbed about 1.5 million refugees already, and the volume is about 100,000 refugees a day. Those who have arrived since the 24th of February, if they arrive directly from the territory of the Ukraine or as spouses of those, are getting free public transport to their destinations, a one of payment, access to social security, social number to allow them to work on employment insurance and benefits on the same terms as Poles, access to schooling, access to free nurseries if they can find a place, the same access to health service as the Poles, although subsidies for medication have not been worked out and that's an urgent problem. So the legislation has changed in a concrete way, although I should emphasize the volume of help is definitely grassroots driven. Um, there are Kids in my three nephews' classes in Warsaw, several Ukrainian kids already, have friends who have offered accommodation to complete strangers. But the border with Belarus remains closed. So what the Polish government has done over the winter months and keeps doing on that border is keeps pushing back in violation of the Geneva Convention, the status of refugees, people who are arriving from Middle East and elsewhere, and it makes illegal offering of help by Polish agents who want to do it, Polish NGOs, and makes reporting by Polish press of what's going on there illegal, in that it blocks access to it, not in the sense that they cannot print the information. So given who runs Poland now, that is not a surprise. But I'd say there has been silence and even acclamation from too many people in Poland, there was, I would say, a lot of willingness to believe the worst about those refugees. And given that Russia and Belarus encouraged these refugees to arrive at this border, and Belarus now keeps forcefully pushing them back such that they're trapped, I see very little prospect now of the Polish policy changing. But I still think the main explanatory factor for why the Ukrainian borders are open is twofold. First, there is no way the Polish army could have held that border. So even an anti-immigration government had to open it up, given the length of the border and the volume of people coming in. And second, many people sign up to the view that you cannot close the border when the war is right by your land border. The way you can if it is elsewhere and someone else could help. Now, I don't think this argument justifies closing the border, so I disagree with it. It's only motivationally operating right now. And I don't think it works because it matters not whether you are the only agent who could help, but whether you are the only agent who will help. But there are also more understandable reasons for partiality, for Poland in particular, to Ukraine, so some Poles and Ukrainians in Poland, of which there is probably over a million prior to the war, have relatives in Ukraine. Poland shares hundreds of years of history with Ukrainians and Ruthenians before them, living in Poland and the territorial history, with Lviv in particular being a historic Polish city. My family on my father's side has lived in the Lviv region for hundreds of years. My father was actually born in that region in 1939, right before the war. And this history includes the history of injustice against Ukrainians by Poles.
And also helping Ukrainians now allows Poland to struggle against a common threat. And I don't mean only that Poland is being re-traumatized by the memory of 1939, when no one came to help Poland, although that's going on. And I don't even, I can't even imagine what it's like for Jewish population in Ukraine <laughs> to have it triggered again, but in addition have the sense that obviously we should not be equating this war with what happened during the Second World War. I mean simply that Poland worries about the threat from Putin itself and sees it as a common struggle, the Ukrainian struggle and the Polish one. So to illustrate the black humor in Poland just now, so the people hypothesizing about what will happen in 2024 when Putin invades Poland. So KFT will shorten the menu of options that are available to Russian citizens. Um, Kamala Harris will fly to Czechia, the Czech Republic, and will say that Czechia is definitely safe. The UK will issue seven visas, and NATO will say that Polish membership was conditional on not being attacked. Already, NATO is to blame anyway. However, I do think that the fact that Ukrainians are white and very similar to Poles in many respects is a major explanatory factor for the extent of integration we are now witnessing being offered by a nationalist populist government. So in the last few years alone, actually, Polish attitudes to Ukrainians have changed and radically improved. And simply in virtue of encountering more of them as the literature on immigration shows, you encounter people, you start fearing them less. And if this all happened just a few years ago, we may have seen less willingness to integrate. That said, there are already attempts to stir discontent, fake posts on neighborhood social media boards about imaginary difficulties that Ukrainians opposing, but there is greater resilience to resist those. So how to feel about what is actually an extremely painful partial border opening and integration? And I might not be getting that balance right yet, because I was surprised by the extent of solidarity shown by Poland, and I may be too optimistic about the hope that it offers than I should be. So one suggestion that I don't think works is that opening the border now to Ukrainians will make it harder for governments to justify closing it to others. I don't think it works because I think bad governments just don't care about consistency. But there are a couple of reasons to hope. First, I think if people feel that they can respond to those in need in a way that does not erode their lives, there will be a larger pool of people ready to do it again. And so there will be less support and acquiescence for closing borders. And the second reason for hope is this. So throughout the Polish-Ukrainian history, there was cooperation, but there was oppression and there was repression and injustice. In the 40s, after the Jewish co-citizens have already experienced the worst fate of all, there was massacre of tens of thousands of ethnic Poles by Ukrainians, and then mass revenge killings by Poles of Ukrainians, and on both sides also killing those who were trying to stop the other side killing. So the fact that this joint history is not an insurmountable obstacle now, despite this grievance being very consciously taught in Polish school by a nationalist populist government as a grievance, is a fact that inspires hope. But whether that hope materializes and whether it works and doesn't descend into something terrible will depend on whether this integration is successful and whether this enthusiasm turns into resilience. So the main thing I think that Britain could do is not focus on opening the borders. I'll say in a second it should do that too. But supporting the countries that have opened the borders already. But Britain should open its borders too, because although most people want to remain in proximity to what they left with their parents and often partners whom they left behind, some of them may want to come here as well. And even a partial opening in Britain will be valuable. And maybe especially because of the absence of closed shared history, although Britain has committed injustice against Ukrainians too. And that's because the experience of supporting people in the need can possibly mean less support in future for closing borders and accepting lies about those that we are not admitting. <laughs>
Great. <clears throat> so thank you a lot, and thank you, Jeff, for uh, organizing such a such a great uh, event. Uh, I'll be talking about the role of social media in war and the role that they are playing in this in this war. So this is something that Jeff has briefly. Um, um, mentioned in his opening remarks, but this is a, an issue that has received uh, very little attention so far by philosophers, despite the fact that um, social media are playing an increasingly uh, crucial role in, um, in armed conflicts. Um, and the war in, in Ukraine has made uh, even more apparent how important uh, this role is. Now, of course, the, the, the first time where um, it became clear that social media had such an important role to play was during the Arab Spring in 2011. So that was the first time that we had um, access to high quality uh, pictures and, and videos of what was happening um, that could be uh, reshared. Oops very, uh, very uh, quickly and without editorial uh, filter. Um, now, it's, uh, th there are reasons to believe that the impact of uh, social media in Ukraine is even more significant than it was in 2011. One reason, of course, is that uh, the number of social media users has um, increased exponentially in the last 10 years. So just to give you an example, the number of Facebook users has um, um, is three times as, as big as, as it was in 2011. But more importantly, the reason why uh, social media are more in, are, are um, uh, especially play an especially crucial role in this conflict is that um, in 2011, social media were still primarily used to socialize and for entertainment. Whereas today, this is where most people have access to the news. That's how people access news content. Um, so via Facebook or, or Twitter or clips on YouTube. And traditional outlets are aware of this and that's why they, uh, uh, they uh, craft their, um, uh, their, their segments, for example, so that they can be easily uh, posted on, on YouTube. And that's where uh, most people get, uh, get to see the co that content. So unsurprisingly, uh, Russia has tried to uh, control and silence social media during this conflict. As, as Jeff has mentioned, uh, several social media have been shut down. Um, Facebook is, is, uh, uh, was shut down and, and um, Instagram was shut down more recently. Um, access to Twitter is restricted. Now, interestingly, these companies fought back. So Twitter and Facebook and other companies have launched privacy protected sites on, on the dark web to bypass Russia's block. And so Russia is actually struggling to control the narrative of how the conflict is unfolding, even at home, um, even uh, uh, in, in Russia. And this, of course, has implication not only for Russian public opinion, which in turn affects the ability of the Russian government to pursue its plans, but also for public opinion in other countries, public opinion around the world, which in turn affects the pressure that political leaders of other countries feel to step in to help Ukraine and, say, inflict economic sanctions. And it's interesting here to compare um, the uh, reaction um, <coughs> that the uh, emergency in uh, Ukraine has produced with the very weak reaction that um, uh, other human rights violations around the world that are ongoing um, have produced. Um, so for example, China has a very tight control over social media. Of course, Facebook is not present in China. And this is, this is not the only explanation of the fact that um, uh, in the international response to, say, uh, re-education camps uh, in, in China has been, um, uh, has been um, um, quite, quite weak, but it's one of the it's one of the reasons that China is, a, is very good at 
uh, controlling the narrative at home, and we have uh, very little access to certainly to images uh, that come from uh, from um, from China. So these are, I think, the sort of considerations that one encounters reading uh, newspapers or listening to the news, and I think they are they are sound. Social media do have the capacity to significantly disrupt the control that governments have over the narrative of unjust aggression and other forms of human rights violation. And this role is, to some extent at least, to be welcome. But there's, of course, a risk that social media um, um, get uh, glorified and, 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 um, and we lose sight of some of the worries that we should have um, in relation to the role that they are playing. So the first uh, worry is that, um, well, is of course that now strategically important decisions that will significantly impact the outcome of the war are ultimately made by the CEOs of multinationals rather than by governments. And whereas the, um, Governments are in the business of um, preserving peace and, and security in the international arena. Um, CEOs are in the business of maximizing the profit for their shareholders. And so one question, of course, is how much freedom these companies, companies like Facebook and Twitter, should have in making decisions that will have such a momentous impact on the conflict. How should we think about their capacity to uh, um, affect the result of the conflict in such, a, in such a pervasive way? And then there's another question which is getting even less um, attention, um, but I think it's, it, it's crucial. And, and this, relate, this relates to the role that social media have played in Putin's strategy of weakening the capacity of other countries to curtail his agenda in the process that led to the aggression. So something that um, was really striking, I thought, it, the, the tone has changed a little bit uh, after the first week when the international response um, was uh, against the Russian aggression was stronger, and you know the, the, it became um, clear that uh, um, you know that what Russia was doing was. Uh, was uh, morally indefensible. But in the first few days, um, there was a vast number of conservative uh, leaders close to Trump and a number of leading conservative commentators, primarily from the Fox universe, um, who, significant to, who to a significant extent condone, if not openly, praise Putin's action. Trump himself said that you know, there was a, a work of genius. Um, and now, this attitude, of course, would have been unthinkable only a few years ago, say, before 2016. And this attitude is the product of years of disinformation and misinformation that Russia has conducted in the US and in UK and elsewhere, using social media to divide and polarize the public discourse, primarily by fomenting a certain type of identity politics around hot issues such as race and, and immigration. And the aim of this process is to change the perception of reality so that despite uh, information uh, about events like the current aggression being available, we are prevented from reaching sensible conclusions about a number of pressing issues, including those affecting the justice of the uh, of episodes of aggression. Now, the point that I want to make here is the following. Uh, whenever this sort of uh, uh, issue comes up, the natural way to, the natural response is to frame it as an issue of free speech. Surely people have right to express their opinions, even if they are incorrect, even if they are not reasonable. And so we should not expect, uh, we should not expect um, platforms like Facebook or Twitter to take a position on these on these on these views. Um, 
But this way of framing the problem is misleading once we realize that social media can be exploited by international actors like Putin to weaken international peace and security. Effectively, what social media um, have been used for is to uh, produce influence activities that are executed by state actors in pursuit of geopolitical goals. So this is, this is also a security matter. This is not just a free speech matter. And so if you're interested in thinking of how international peace and security can be preserved, we need to think carefully about how to regulate social media, not only in time of war, but also in time of peace. I'll stop here. Good evening. Um, I wish to thank Corpus Christi and the Faculty of Philosophy, and especially Sarah Watson, for helping us and supporting this uh, important event. I want to thank also the speakers for uh, agreeing to come in such short notice. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I have a um, stutter. I get stuck from uh, time to time, so uh, bear with me. Um, I wanted to talk about, about uncertainty, or more precisely, the implications of uncertainty on our moral evaluation of the justness of, of the war. Now, in philosophy, we distinguish between two major sources of uncertainty. There are others, but the first one called moral uncertainty, and this is uncertainty about whether the ethical theory is correct, well, whether we should choose that ethical theory because it is correct. Now, as uh, Jeff noted, in philosophy of war, generally we work in a, in a field called just war theory. The basic assumptions, well, the very basic assumptions are agreed upon, and we work within that theory, which presumes that war can be just sometimes, rarely so, and the major moral constraints upon the use of force, which are necessity and proportionality. Thus, the question of, mo of moral uncertainty is less important. More important is the question of factual uncertainty, also called uh, empirical or descriptive uncertainty. And this uncertainty pertains to whether about non-moral facts and how they influence our evaluation of the morality of the war as a whole and actions in the war. It is important because it helps us to uh, well, when we have factual uncertainty, it is very difficult to assign moral responsibility, culpability. And war, is, as, as, as is well known, is the province of uncertainty. Nothing is hurting in war. Um, and as a result, people involved in war are, find it hard to, to, to make moral, moral evaluations. Um, the problem is generally that we always, we always uh, evaluate the justness of the war based on partial knowledge always. Consequently, if we do not important non-moral facts, we cannot evaluate the justness of the war or of particular actions. Now, uncertainty influences the moral evaluation of the war on every level. We can think about that. The title of this event is called, is dealing with the war in Ukraine, but it can be that in a month from now we will be discussing a whole other event, much broader conflict, or the Russians may be withdrawing, ending the war. We don't know that. Another possibility, of course, is, is that a strange cruise missile on a NATO base in Europe or, or an attack on carrier of the US in somewhere in the world will trigger a possible response, and the consequences of these we cannot evaluate now. Uh, as Massimo noted, surprisingly, while we do live in an, in an age that knowledge is, uh, flows quite quickly and more efficiently than it was in the past, uh, the issue of factual uncertainty in war is not yet even close to resolve. Now, about the war in Ukraine, as Jeff noted in the beginning, there is, 
no uncertainty whether this war is, is unjust. I think that the same as the Allied war against, against Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan were just wars, we can assume safely that the war of in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine is unjust, pure war of aggression. And thus, because Russia has no just cause, nothing it can do is ne either necessary or proportionate. But what I thought is about the, the reaction of the West. As I said, the most important moral constraints on the use of force are necessity and proportionality. And I was thinking whether the response of the West to the Russian aggression is necessary and proportionate, and how should we estimate these factors? bearing in mind that there is always a certainty gap. Now, as you know, the West, well, mainly the US, declare that they will not confront the Russian military directly. And those who are liable to be harmed now is the Russian military forces, and of course, the Russian uh, government. And these people are liable to, to be harmed. Instead, the West responded mainly by severe economic sanctions, which they were taken mainly by corporations, also um, governments, on Russian citizens. Generally, civilians are not liable to be harmed. Um, and I was thinking, why do government of the West took this decision? It is mainly due to the uncertainty about the Russian response to such intervention. And as Jeff uh, noted about the hazard of uh, this war escalating to a global war, perhaps even nuclear war. However, it is only because of the unwillingness of the West to confront with those who are liable, the Russian military, we are inflicting, we do not know actually, major harms upon those who are not liable to be harmed, instead of confronting those who are liable to, to be harmed. The moral status of this decision to impose the sanctions are, I think, universally uh, uh, agreed upon, accepted. In fact, countries that do not participate in the sanctions are being condemned, or uh, co-operations. Co How can we measure the impact of these sanctions on the well-being of non-liable Russian uh, citizens? <laughs> we do not know that. On economic stability, nutrition, healthcare, transportation, or even the influence of the well-being of future generations. We read that the ruble now le uh, worth less than one cent. But the situation is perceived as, as just, as necessary in proportion, because economic sanctions are perceived as a less harmful act than the use of military force. But I think it is perceived as such, mainly because of factual uncertainty. We, don't, we, we do not know the influence of these sanctions on the Russian uh, population. By the way, the oil and gas companies, uh, which are the major uh, 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 finance source of the Russian military, are, are exempted. Perhaps because Germany uh, imports almost 50% of its gas from, uh, from Russia. And Russia is one of the largest, perhaps the largest state in the world with a population of, one, of over than 146 million people. And when, if we think in the morality of war that numbers count, we should think about that. Now, I'm just, I'm not saying, I'm not making a, 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 a judgment here, but I do say that, morally speaking, this is a very complicated, and problematic situation. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, that's the end of our presentations. Uh, at the moment, I have one question from uh, someone who is uh, watching uh, via Zoom. I, I don't see any hands being thrust up immediately uh, uh, in front of us. There's one. Let me do this.
I've got the one question here on this little device. Let's uh, take that first, um, uh, because it's short. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, start with you um, and take questions from others in, in the uh, audience here. Uh, this is a question uh, sent through about an hour ago. Um, this is from Corbinian Ruger, who is a uh, professor of philosophy at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in, uh, in Munich, in Germany. He says, hi all, thanks for putting this together. Can you say something about the moral duties of the Ukrainian government? In particular about the claim that the Ukrainian government has a duty to surrender to Putin <coughs> sooner rather than later in order to shield its citizens from even more harm. To be clear, it's not me making this claim. So he's not saying, he's not <laughs> taking a stance on this, just wants us to say something about it. Um, let me begin by saying, it seems to me that um, what the Ukrainian government ought to do uh, in, uh, about whether it should s surrender um, should be determined by uh, the will of the Ukrainian people insofar as it can be determined. Insofar as I can tell, there, is no, there are no calls from among the citizens of Ukraine to surrender to Russia. The attitude, as far as I can tell, seems to be uh, uh, in favor of continued resistance. Um, and I think it would, it would be uh, problematic if the government surrendered against the wishes of the population. On the other hand, one thing to be said in favor of surrender would be that um, the resistance to the Russians could then be carried out through nonviolent means, nonviolent resistance of the sort that was advocated by Gandhi and, and, and many others, which potentially could be effective uh, given, again, the uh, availability of social media so that it, you know, in, in Ukraine it would be very difficult to prevent images from uh, images of uh, uh, nonviolent resistance and so on from being circulated around the world and continuing to build pressure on, on Russia. So that would be one thing to be said in, in favor of surrender. Does anybody else want to say anything in response to Corbinian's question? Yeah, just something short. I mean, in the um, just war theory, we often focus on individuals' rights to life and how they are impacted. And it is striking that in this war, you feel like Ukraine could save the rights to life of many of its citizens if it surrendered. But it would, in some sense, be a trade-off of saving their rights to life now versus future harms that a Russian occupation would certainly impose on them. Also, on the balance of not surrendering, even if it means um, jeopardizing the rights to life of many of Ukrainians, is their aggregate political rights to self-determination, which I think <coughs> weigh quite heavily. It's sometimes alleged that from a moral individualist point of view, you, know, you sort of lose sight of the political community and the political rights that are at stake. But I think, um, given how um, unequivocally Ukrainians do not want to be part of Russia, I think their right to determine that fate as a group weighs quite heavily against the duty to surrender just to protect, not just, but to protect their rights to physical integrity, at least in the short run. So I don't think Ukraine has a duty to surrender. Um, I found it interesting the interplay between different members of the panel having differing opinions on the moral obligations of NATO vis-a-vis -vis whether intervention was immoral in a direct military sense or whether it was not necessarily or, or whether it wasn't immoral. Um, I suppose it's also blended with the point about factual uncertainty about economic sanctions. <coughs> to me, to my untrained mind, it seemed like the view that the option of NATO countries to, um, to effectively call for aid via Article 5 being merely an option presented, that was presented as the idea that absolved the idea of it being immoral to intervene. To me, that seemed perhaps to be putting much more uncertainty around the Russian response, because I agree that NATO members have the option but perhaps there's the idea of if there was a, something that the Russians might expect would lead to an immediate triggering of Article 5, perhaps we should give that the certainty, or, or I think the question of certainty or uncertainty around that, I find interesting to hear what the panel thinks of that, <coughs> if that made any sense as a question. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think there's considerable uncertainty around lots of 
these questions. I think that's part of the um, what makes this so difficult is that we're trying to predict how somebody who seems in some ways much less predictable than we thought he would be will respond to various stimulus. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not a sort of you know expert in international relations, so it's very hard for me to kind of you know. I'm sure there's lots of research on how. Um, the, the, the likely effects of various types of agreements and deterrent effects and so on. I mean, it's very hard, of course, to make predictions about these things because you're reasoning about counterfactuals necessarily, right? You're trying to work out what would have <laughs> happened had you behaved differently. And of course, that thing didn't happen. And so you don't know what would have happened. And so um, it's always pretty speculative. Um, and I think that also applies to um, uh, the Corbinian's question about, um, which is, I think, a, really a question about the reasonable prospect of success. So Yanina's response um, presented this as a trade-off between a loss of life and securing rights of sovereignty, but I don't think that really is the trade-off. I think the question is, is it permissible for the Ukrainians to continue to resist if they will not, therefore, secure their sovereignty rights, right? If this is a war that they will lose and all they're doing is delaying the inevitable, then you've got the loss of life and the loss of the sovereignty rights, and that looks bad. Um, and so I don't think we can just sort of present this as a kind of, well, is it up to the Ukrainians to choose whether they want to sacrifice lives for the sake of the sovereignty rights? There's a separate question about what do you do in a situation in which um, it seems like the prospect of success is so slim that most just war theorists ordinarily think that it's impermissible to pointlessly kill people, including Russian soldiers, if you're not going to win um, or you're not going to secure anything that's proportionate to those killings. Um, and so that seems like the difficult question. It's, and I think, again, the uncertainty arises because we, we don't know at the moment what would count as success. We don't know what it is that, I mean, clearly this war has been much more costly for Russia than they initially envisaged, right? And so what they might be willing to accept is moving precisely because of the degree of Ukrainian resistance and also Western support via sanctions. Um, but... So that's a kind of, in some sort of, you know, it's a movable goal, right? If they had an initial goal that they would repel this invasion in a few days, and, you know, clearly that's off the table, right? But, and the Russian aggression has become more violent as it's gone on. Um, but what counts as a reasonable prospect of success? It depends partly on what you're looking for <coughs> for success. Um, and again, it's a question of what the Russians might accept, which at the moment we just don't know. So I think it's hard to answer those kinds of questions. I suppose I would just very quickly just, I guess, sorry, perhaps it was my rambling, but I suppose it was more a question of what was discussed was between different panelists had different views on the morality of NATO direct military intervention. And you suggested the idea that because NATO members, if they are attacked, don't, they don't have a 100% obligation to call for aid and it, it doesn't 100% lead to World War III. I guess my view was perhaps that that doesn't take into account the Russian response to if Russia shoots down a plane and it, you know, if Russia attacks a NATO member, perhaps indirectly or without, you know, higher command being necessarily aware, I could picture many scenarios in which Russia then uh, effectively indirectly escalates, whether they directly escalate with nuclear attacks or whether it leads to further escalation on either side. I suppose... I was more interested in the, do, do we see that the uncertainty in the Russian response there is as uncertain as the economic sanctions, or should we be assuming a much greater degree of, cert of certainty in the Russian response to any sort of major direct conflict between NATO and Russia, um, given the impact of if that were to occur again. Could I, could I say something in response to that? I mean, it's very, very brief. Uh, and that is that what I emphasized in my remarks was the threat of escalation to nuclear war, to the use of nuclear weapons. And Putin was very explicit about this uh, quite early on. Uh, again, a, a form of blackmail. Uh, here's the point. Um, what is the probability that the Russians would actually use nuclear weapons if some NATO country were to intervene um, in Ukraine? No idea. Point, though, is that that outcome, the, the use of nuclear weapons by Russia, uh, 
possible responses from other, <coughs> other countries, whatever, would be so bad that even a tiny probability <coughs> may be sufficient to make it impermissible. That, uh, so we, there can be a lot of uncertainty about this, but even so, we think that's off limits. That's why I said directly, direct military intervention would be ru is ruled out because it's disproportionate. It's disproportionate because this, the, the threat of escalation is just too, too, too serious, too. Um, I've, oh gosh, yeah, we've got a lot here. I, I do have one more question here and there are others. Nigel uh, Warburton has a question there too. But, so I'm, I'm sorry, I went on longer than I should have. Let's try to be brief because we don't have too much time left. Sure. Okay, so two points. So one on the side of non-surrender, just because it wasn't mentioned, not that we don't know it, there is also the further possible attacks against other states and their lives lost there. So it's not just the future lives of Ukrainian <laughs> citizens and the sovereignty, but the future lives of other people who might be attacked. On the idea of not invoking um, NATO collective defense, I'm imagining Russia would still assume that this would be invoked, right, in any planning. And just as long as you, can, you cannot credibly commit yourself to not invoking it in future, it just remains on the table as something that would be invoked. So I just wanted to make a, a quick point on uh, Kropinian's question and, and um, Alan's response to it, and I think uh, uh, Janina touched on it. Namely, Helen is right that um, you know, there's an interesting question of whether um, uh, it would be permissible for Ukrainians to fight back if they lack a, a reasonable prospect of success. But I think that that's not the only question. I think the question that uh, Kropinian had in mind, that Janina also had in mind, was that some just were theorists um, believe that uh, protecting self-determination simply is not a sufficiently weighty interest to justify a resort to lethal violence. And so some just were theorists believe that, in fact, Ukrainians um, uh, should surrender. Um, now, there, there, is, there are several positions on the table here. Some uh, others believe that um, they are permitted to protect self uh, defense self-determination if that will prevent further uh, uh, human rights violations, violations to, say, bodily integrity. And then there are uh, some, not many, who believe that <coughs> self-determination by itself is sufficiently weighty interest to, um, to um, justify resorting to lethal violence. So I think there is a, there is a, a broader question here that, that, that is worth bearing in mind. I would only want to pick up on Alex's uh, question about uncertainty. Uncertainty works both ways, both uh, about the, the aggressor, Russia, and Ukraine. The Russians, as you might have heard, are carrying, the Russian armed forces are carrying crematoriums. You know, the either the, the, the guess is to either dispose Russian soldiers' bodies, hence to limit the opposition back at, at home, or either to hide uh, war crimes. So they can argue, we are not aggressors, we are fighting uh, uh, specifically against armed forces, hence uh, the evidence, thus creating more factual uncertainty. The thing is, the West, I think, responded, well, the US especially, responded badly by declaring that under no circumstances we will fight Russia, thus creating factual uncertainty with <coughs> Russia. They know we will not attack you, and on the other hand, the Russians are creating factual uncertainty among <coughs> the, um, the West. So Russia knows exactly how to play the issue and how to, how to build this factual uncertainty. And indeed, we don't know what will happen. Uh, um, <coughs> as far as I know, we've still got... We've got Two questions, uh, six minutes to go. We will try to limit our responses. Um, I'll take Nigel Warburton's question first, and then we have one question here from a remote uh, 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 participant. Um, just a naive question. Uh, we've been talking about certainty and uncertainty. It seems to me pretty certain that Biden wouldn't make a first nuclear strike, and it's uncertain whether Putin would. And that's a huge advantage. The uncertainty actually is a strategic uh, 
device for him because mm -hmm. we don't know. Um, in that world, this kind of heckler's veto situation where um, he, he can simply say, if you do X, I'll release a nuclear war. Um, he can keep doing stuff. He can keep moving into other countries. There's no obvious stopping point. I don't know what the moral response to that is, but it can't be just to roll over, can it? Yeah. One of the points I made is that um, villains do often have this power to make what would otherwise be um, proportionate responses disproportionate by incredibly threatening uh, to do things that no moral person would ever do. And we look at what Putin has done already. And it's just shocking beyond all belief. And we see what uh, Assad has done in Syria and uh, you know, other dictators and autocrats. We know that they will do these things. And you know, that is a, a huge advantage that they have, um, which has been acknowledged in, in, the, in the talk. So um, it, it can't be just to roll over. But um, so what we have to do is take the options um, like uh, uh, military aid, economic sanctions, boycotts, and so on, these means short of actual war, uh, 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 which can be effective, but which it, it's pretty difficult for even Putin to say, we, we, we will uh, uh, use nuclear weapons in response to economic sanctions can't do that anyway because economic sanctions are too, uh, you know, they, they're coming from too many sources. They're not just coming from a single state that one can respond to in that way. I think, oh, let me try and speak, and apologies for the coughing, by the way, it's not, not COVID. Um, but I think you're asking the question is if, if you have a sort of prima facie morally permissible course of action in front of you, but you know it will trigger um, a response that creates vast harm and is itself morally wrongful, do you have to take the wrongdoer's actions into account in calibrating what is permissible for you? And I think one, there's no easy answer here, but I think one thing we need to raise is the question, who will bear the moral cost of the wrongdoer's predicted actions? And if that is yourself, I think you might make the sort of principal choice of saying, I will not be bullied by the expectations of someone, you know, of, an, of moral wrongdoing that I will trigger. <clears throat> but if other people um, bear the moral costs of that expected wrongdoing, I think you may not be in a position where it's permissible for you to do what would otherwise be a prima facie morally right course of action. And in the case of nuclear annihilation, obviously, you know, other people than those who are making the decisions bear those costs. So I think it is impermissible for NATO to act in a way where we have credible intelligence or good reason to believe that it would trigger a nuclear war. That madman approach to nuclear weapons is quite common in the you know, short human history that we've had of nuclear weapons. It's not a prerogative even just of autocrats. There have Amer been American presidents that have espoused too. It's one of the pernicious side effects of nuclear weapons and really just hits home the moral cost of the fact that we won't be able to rid us of them and that they create these morally intractable problems, which close off avenues of otherwise permissible assistance. Just can't resist it because it's so depressing. So you're of course right, having a mad person on one side traps us in this logic. It might be good to have a mad person on another side in the short term advantage. So we can all console ourselves. There is a silver lining if Trump gets reelected. <laughs> <laughs> Black humor. Yeah, but he's an ally of Putin's. So that's the problem. <laughs> okay, we, we've got one question from somebody uh, remote. This is Joris van Arsel. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the name correctly, but in any case, here's the question for, for the panelists. How do the panelists uh, view the censure of Russian state-owned uh, <coughs> media? And I think that probably means uh, uh, um, uh, <coughs> censoring. Uh, in the EU, given the fact that a similar response regarding foreign media in Russia would soon be likely to follow, as it did, for example, the BBC. On the one hand, I understand trying to limit the spread of Kremlin misinformation and propaganda, but on the other hand, should we not try to keep as many lines of communication open to try to inform the Russian public? 
what balance should be struck in access or control of information? Well, so there's, there's no, there's no um, easy recipe, I think. But if we focus on, uh, on a kind of time of war, so the, the, you know, uh, if we leave aside for a moment the very serious problem that I mentioned toward the end of my, of my <coughs> intervention, um, one, uh, I, I don't have an, an easy recipe, but one uh, thing which is, in, which is very important to me is whether we should, um, whether you know, companies like uh, um, uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, multinational that are not uh, directly accountable to a government, can make decisions that, uh, uh, if they have complete freedom to make decisions in this, in this matter. Um, because, of course, the consequences of these decisions are going to have profound impact on, on, on the war and the outcome of the war. Um, and as I said, slogans aside, it's unlikely that um, uh, it's unlikely that these decisions will not be informed by the goals that these these uh, um, companies have, which is to which is to maximize uh, profit. And I think that that's the goal, really. That uh, 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 that you know, the, the the two questions that I have uh, flagged at the end of the of my presentations are not separate. Uh, it's, the problem is not that um, companies like Facebook or, um, or, or Twitter have an interest in uh, uh, disseminating um, um, the, the, the sort of propaganda that uh, Putin and other, uh, and other autocrats uh, want, to, want to push. Um, there is a problem in the business model of these organizations that is... Uh, you know, the, the, the cornerstone of the business model is to maximize attention. And the, 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 the content that maximizes attention online is divisive and uh, uh, highly uh, uh, emotionally uh, uh, charged content. And this is, uh, you know, this is um, uh, uh, something that uh, uh, autocrats and, and, and uh, um, like, like uh, Putin can can play on very, very easily. And there's a playbook that uh, has been used by, by these autocrats to, uh, to exploit this, um, this uh, mechanism. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, don't have an easy, I don't have an easy recipe, but uh, the fact that they shouldn't be in charge of making by themselves these decisions is certainly a starting point. I, w I would just say one, one thing about this, and that is that I think uh, media organizations like RT and Sputnik have made themselves liable to be uh, censored, shut down, uh, 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 silenced in the West, precisely because they have been so heavily complicit in, in this uh, unjust invasion. I mean, they have made it possible by disseminating the lies that uh, Putin has. Uh, yes, I didn't speak to that, but I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are two sides to, to the question here. But on that one, I think uh, it's just clear enough that these are not responsible, truth telling uh, news outlets at all. They are instruments of propaganda. Um, and, you know, propaganda that is lying propaganda. So this is where the interesting, if I can just uh, yeah. jump in for a second, this is where the you know the the the, um, the point that I that I brought up toward the end of my of my intervention, which is this framing this problem as a as a matter of free speech can be misleading. There is a security angle to this, and it's uh, uh, you know perhaps uh, you know in perhaps in, in good faith or in bad faith, but that angle is downplayed constantly. Okay, I, we, we're we're beyond our, our schedule, but we have one. We'll take one final question, and then and then we'll bring it to an end. And if the, anybody needs, to, some people have been trickling out. If others need to go, don't don't feel em, embarrassed about doing so. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So w one way in which uh, Russia is framing the invasion is that it's a instance of self-defense, maybe against NATO or whatever. I'm wondering. So 
even if it was the case, if even if it were a case of self-defense, it seems to me that it would still be an unjust war. So I was wondering what your thoughts would be on that, or if it was actually an instance of self-defense, would that really yeah, imply that we have to rethink everything? But I thinking about the case where everything is the same, like Russia is the aggressor, Russia, Russia is doing the invasion. It's just that maybe there was really a way of playing, the, playing devil's advocate to think that it's really a case of self-defense. <coughs> but I would like to object to that. I would like to understand how we could still say that it's unjustified, it's not morally permissible, and so on. Okay. Can, can, can I say something quick on that and then a lot very quickly? Um, no doubt there are people in Russia who do fear NATO encroachment right up to the borders. The United States was willing to risk nuclear war by uh, uh, sending uh, ships to intercept the Russian missiles which were headed for Cuba in 1961, which precipitated the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the United States did not want Soviet missiles uh, stationed so close to its own borders. So we can imagine that, there is, that some people in Russia could be motivated by defensive concerns. What we can say about that, however, is that one of the constraints uh, that you find in traditional just war theory, revisionist just war theory, theories of individual self-defense and so on, is a requirement of necessity sometimes called a requirement of last resort. War in Ukraine is not a last resort uh, in an effort by Russia to prevent, for example, the installation of uh, NATO nuclear missiles on Ukrainian territory. That's not even a, 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 a live option at the moment. Uh, this is what diplomacy is for. If, if Russia has fears about this in the future, uh, there are many ways of addressing those fears and trying to resolve the problem short of war. Alad, yeah. I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, sure. The, 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 uh, the thing is, the interesting thing is that if you combine all the justifications, Russia, uh, Putin has made a statement uh, translated to English in which we, you can read all the justifications he gave to, to, to this invasion. Combined together, they do not amount to a just cause which is the first instance that, that you ask whether this war is just. Um, his claims about self-defense are false. Um, you can talk about, about issues of NATO and missiles, but again, there was no an armed attack. NATO, it is indeed a pact of strong nations. None of them uh, are willing or planning to, to invade Russia. Ukraine has not invaded Russia again. Uh, and uh, his claims about neo-Nazis are quite strange when this country elected a Jewish leader. But if you, if you would go and read the justifications Hitler gave in 1938 for the annexation of the Sudetland, it, the resemblance is quite amazing. He, didn't, he did not invent anything. It's exactly, I'm not speaking about Hitler of Auschwitz. I'm, I'm speaking about Hitler of the foreign policy of uh, of Germany. So in terms of just war theory, no justification at all. Even if you accept his fears about missiles near his, um, near his border. Okay. We will conclude with that. Thank you all very much for coming along. Thanks to all of you for making, in some cases, the trip to Oxford. And uh, uh, all of us need to keep uh, doing what we can in response to this uh, this event. Um, as as I think uh, all of us are aware, um, this is important for all of us. This is not just a problem for Ukrainians. This is a, a, a problem of uh, huge significance for the whole of the world. The world is being transformed back into... Uh, sort of barbaric place that it was in 1939 and uh, we just have to resist this so thank you so much for coming along thank you <laughs>